Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Dr. Matthew Wailiki. Um, I am an earth scientist, and I am in the process of putting together a couple of lecture series that I will be putting out on YouTube. You'll be able to find that on my YouTube channel, um, which is Matthew Wailiki. Um, I'll also be posting uh, links to this on my Twitter, at Matthew Wailiki. Um, a little background about me, I have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and cellular biology. I also have a PhD in geochemistry from the Department of Earth, Space and Planetary Sciences at UCLA. Um, I've been an assistant professor now in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Alabama since 2016. And I will be discussing in this lecture series um, about the Earth and an introduction to Earth science. And in this lecture series, we will cover topics from the formation of the Earth and the solar system and the elements. We'll discuss plate tectonics and our three major rock types, igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, and sedimentary rocks. We'll go into discussing Earth processes such as earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, we'll talk about how we can uh, look at different time periods on the Earth, and so how do we date different rock types or fossils. Um, we'll talk about absolute dating through geochronology and radiometric means. We'll also talk about relative dating. And we'll go into um, talking about the hydrologic cycle and how water shapes our modern planet. And we'll finish with a few lectures discussing climate. I won't go too much into that because I'll save a, a longer discussion on climate for my next series of lectures. Um, but if you enjoy these, please share these with as many people as you can. Um, I will be, like I said, posting this on to, links onto this on Twitter. So if you want to leave comments there, I'll do my best to address any questions that you have. Um, if you see something that I say that's wrong, let me know and we can discuss it and correct it. But um, I hope you enjoy. And so let's begin by looking at this very first slide. We're gonna start with this first lecture that I call Earth in Context. We're gonna start by taking a, a, a zoomed out view of our planet and our solar system and even the universe in general, um, because if we're gonna start honing in on Earth, it's good to know how the solar system came to be, how we think the universe came to be and the elements inside it before we start zooming in on Earth. We've achieved something very unique in the last few years or maybe even a couple decades is that we have really become an almost extra solar system exploration species. We have now multiple spacecraft that are essentially leaving our solar system um, for example, the Voyager 1 and 2 missions. Now these aren't doing much exploration out in the, in the vastness of space. They really are just letting us know where they are and that they're still alive. Most of the scientific instrumentation has been shut down long ago to save battery power, but we've succeeded in actually sending things beyond our solar system. And this is uh, one of the first times as a species we can claim that we're exploring even if it's just by sending things out there that aren't doing much. Um, we're exploring the, the vastness of space beyond our own solar system. And so that's what you can see here in the image where the Voyager missions are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about New Horizons when we talk about Pluto as well. Um, so we call our planet the pale blue dot. And that really comes from this image of Earthrise taken in 1968 from one of the Apollo missions, where we really started to identify our planet in the vastness of space. Before we had these images of Earth, it's difficult to really realize that our planet is this little pale blue dot in the vastness of space. And um, it's images like this that really brought along and invigorated the modern day environmental movement and the, the push to protect our planet. Um, it's known as the pale blue dot because over 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And that has this blue hue to it as viewed from space. And so the 
the planet really does appear as this pale blue dot that you see here taken from 1968's uh, Earthrise, uh, a, a photograph no, known as Earthrise. Now, when we look at Earth from the moon, it looks very different than when we look at Earth from 3.7 billion miles away. So this is an image of Earth in the yellow circle there taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft in 1990. The artifacts that you can see that almost look like sunbeams are not actually real. Those are artifacts from the camera. But you can see that Earth really is a pale little dot in the vastness of space. And especially when you look at it from 3.7 billion miles away, that's about 40 times the distance between the Earth and the sun away from us. And the, the, the planet really takes on a much different view when you're this far away. It was that image that led Carl Sagan to give a famous speech at Cornell University in 1994. I was a sophomore in high school. I remember this speech really well. And I'm going to read it to you because I think that the words that he, Carl Sagan spoke in 1994 are even more true today. We succeeded in taking that picture. And if you look at it, you see a dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives. The aggregate of all our joys and sufferings, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother and father, every inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and in triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of the dot on scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner of the dot. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. To my mind, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. I really think that those words put our relative insignificance into context. We think we have all these problems. We we get angry when someone cuts us off on the freeway. And I think if you can remove yourself from that and kind of think of the universe and our role in the universe and on the planet as, as relatively insignificant, those problems kind of fade away and you try to make the best of the time that you have on the planet. I really think these words are probably more prevalent today or maybe more powerful today than they were in 1994 when they were spoken by Dr. Sagan. So the original view of how our solar system and essentially the universe worked was known as the geocentric model. And the geocentric model of the universe held that all celestial bodies, including the sun, revolved around the earth. It was first proposed by the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle in the 14th century and was later refined by Greek astronomers such as Ptolemy in the second century. And this was very understandable Philosophers would wake up in the morning, they would see the sun rise in the east, it would set in the west, it would wake up the next morning, it would do it again. It didn't feel like the earth was moving. And so it was reasonable that the, the idea was that the earth was at the center and we watched the moon and the sun go around the earth. And this was known as the geo-earth centric at the center model. And although this was a consensus view by many scientists and philosophers at the time, including the church, it was the work of Nicholas Copernicus, a, a fellow Polish uh, a person like me, um, in 1954, who published a book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres. 
and he proposed what is eventually known as the heliocentric model. And in this model, the sun was at the center of the universe. Um, he used mathematical calculations to show that this model explained the, observ the observed motions of the planets more accurate, accurately than the geocentric model, but he failed to actually have the observational evidence to really support his claim. That observational evidence came with the development of telescopes in the early 17th century and astronomers like Galileo Galilei, who started to observe things like the moons of Jupiter, which he identified that the moons of Jupiter were in fact orbiting Jupiter and not Earth. And this threw into question the entire geocentric model because this was a consensus at the time. This is an image of Galileo facing the Roman Inquisition and uh, he ended up on house arrest for the remainder of his life because of his heretical views that the Earth was not at the center of the universe, which we later found was absolutely correct. This is one of the arguments that I make that consensus in science is meaningless and actually it, it, it sometimes works to hinder our progress towards the truth because people get entrenched in the idea that they know everything. Uh, we'll come back to this when we start talking a little bit about climate, but the new model has been termed the heliocentric model. And the heliocentric model posits that the solar system in what is when the sun is at the center and the planets, including Earth, orbit around it. Um, it replaced the geocentric model and the heliocentric model was later refined by folks like uh, Johannes Kepler, who developed the three laws of planetary motion that we still use today in terms of trying to describe how the planets orbit the sun. And the heliocentric model is our current understanding of our solar system's motion and mass distribution. So at the telescopes that Galileo was using were very different than the telescopes that we have today. And we have a much a better availability to look into the distant cosmos. So that picture on the left is me during my PhD and my long haired hippie days. That's at the top of, of Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii. You can see behind me are the Keck telescopes and the Subaru telescope. Um, these are telescopes that are ground-based telescopes that are, are uh, housed at the Big Island of Hawaii at the very top. And you can see that the top of the Big Island tends to be above the cloud level where you can see some clouds around in that image. And that allows for better viewing at night. One way to avoid having to deal with clouds altogether is to send up telescopes into space. Many of us are familiar with the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. We'll talk about some of the images and some of the data that we acquired from the Hubble Space Telescope. But just in the last year, the, the newest and greatest um, space telescope has gone up. That's an image that you see of it there on the right. That's the James Webb Space Telescope. And we'll take a look at some of the amazing photos that have been uh, taken by the James Webb Telescope in the last year. So this is a image that was taken by the James Webb Telescope of NGC 3324, the Carina Nebula. This is a star forming region that we believe is uh, an actively an active area where new stars are actually being being formed and, and, and the star formation process is occurring. Um, this image was taken just in the last year and you can really see that there is this distribution of dust and gas throughout this area and there's many new stars that are being formed in that area and these are images that Hubble was able to take before but with the new James Webb telescope we can get them in much more detail and we can see areas that we couldn't see before. Here's one more image taken from James Webb in the last year. This is NGC 3132, the Southern Nebula Ring. This is an area of a uh, uh, a nebular source. So this is a, a, an area that has a, an ejecta of about eight layers of gas and dust. It's been ejecting over thousands of years and we can actually see these rings. And we'll talk about why this is important in a minute because this material that can be ejected from these uh, from certain from certain stars are 
what we believe may have triggered our own solar system's formation and also contributed many of the elements that we see in our own solar system. Before talking about our solar system in general, we're going to, we'll discuss a little bit about our galaxy. Um, our galaxy is known as the Milky Way. It is believed to be a spiral galaxy. Now, the image that you see there is not of our galaxy at all because we don't We've never actually sent any sort of spacecraft beyond our galaxy, but we can observe with a, these very technologically advanced space telescopes, we can observe other distant galaxies. And this seems to be a relatively good representation of what our galaxy would look like. We are about two thirds of the way out in one of the spiral arms that you can see in this spiral galaxy. Um, their estimates are anything between about 100 and 400 billion stars in the galaxy. The galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. Um, we use light years as a measure of distance. So one light year is 6 trillion miles. And the reason it's so far is because the speed of light is remarkably fast. It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's kind of a hard number to get your head around. but for, for most of us, we are more familiar with things like miles per hour. That's 670,000 miles per hour. Again, that's kind of hard to picture in your mind, but to put that into context, that'd be like going around the earth 27,000 times in one hour. And so the speed of light is remarkably fast. It takes light from the sun about eight minutes to reach earth. And this is our best estimates of what our galactic environment looks like, our Milky Way galaxy. And as humans and philosophers started to think about the Earth in context and the Earth's place in the solar system and in the universe, two fundamental questions came to light pretty early on. And they are, is the universe getting bigger or smaller or has it always been the same size? And was there a beginning to the universe or has it always been? And these were two fundamental questions that existed ever since the first philosophers started to think about the universe and the Earth's role in the universe. And in order to figure that out, we looked at how waves would change. And we're going to eventually talk about how the light waves of stars, our distant stars, are changing. But one way to put that into perspective is to provide an analogy with sound waves. And Sound waves are very analogous to electromagnetic radiation in the form of light. They are both travel as waves. And if you have ever experienced sitting at a stoplight, for example, and listening to a train go by or at a train at a, at a, at a um, train crossing or, and listening to a train go by and it blows its whistle, as it's approaching you, the sound of the whistle sounds slightly different than as it starts to leave. And the reason of that is because as the train is traveling towards you and it's blowing its horn, the sound waves that are traveling in the direction that the train is traveling, they get somewhat compressed. And the sound waves that are moving in the opposite direction that the train is, tra the train is traveling, they get somewhat expand extended. And so the frequency and the pitch changes. You may have heard that, for example, if an ambulance drove by you or a police uh, a, a police officer drives by with their sirens on, the pitch of the sound of the siren sounds very different as the vehicle approaches you and then as it pulls away. And this is how sound waves work, but this is very analogous to how light waves work. And we call this phenomenon the Doppler effect. So when applying this phenomenon to our observations of the universe, we're doing essentially the same thing. We are looking at how the light waves are being either compressed or stretched, depending on whether the object is moving towards or away from you. If the object moves towards you, the light that's emanating from that object will become a little bit higher frequency, meaning it will be shifted towards the blue side of the spectrum. And if it starts, if the object that is shining a light is traveling away from you, it would be shifted towards a lower frequency, and that would be towards the red side of the spectrum. And one of the first things that the Hubble Space Telescope did or was assigned to do was to start 
doing surveys of the of the night sky and looking very deep and at distant galaxies and trying to identify the relative sense of motion of all of these different stars and galaxies as related to us. And so this is an image in the middle of, a, of an ultra deep field uh, picture by the Hubble Space Telescope. And what they did was they identified 28 individual stars. Those are the little boxes with numbers to them that correspond to the images on the right half of the figure. And what I'd like you to notice is that every time in the center of the figure on the, on the right hand side, you see a, a star that has a red hue to it. And what that meant was that no matter where we looked in the universe, it appeared that everything was moving away from us. Everything had a red shift. It was red shifted, meaning that the, lights were, the light that was emanating from these stars was being stretched somewhat into this lower frequency towards the red. And this suggested to scientists that any which way we look throughout, the, throughout our, our uh, galactic environment, everything is moving away from us. And so how can everything be moving away from us? If you think about this in an analogy of, for example, making some raisin bread, if you have your dough and you mix your raisins in and then you let your dough sit such that it expands and, and it, it proofs a little bit and grows, my wife makes a lot of delicious bread, so I've gotten exposed to some of this, but the, the dough really expands as the yeast does its things and, and you'll see the, the dough dramatically expand. And in that expansion of our raisin bread dough, Inside, if we consider the raisins are individual stars, then as that dough expands, every star, every bit of raisin is moving away from every other bit of raisin. And so what that suggested to scientists about the universe is that the universe is expanding. And if the universe is expanding, it's a natural question to ask, well then, does that mean that if we turn back time, was it all once together at one single point? And this was essentially the birth of the Big Bang Theory. If the universe was expanding, we could turn back time if we make some assumptions about the rate of expansion and some very complex mathematics and physics, we can calculate that in fact, about 13.7 billion years ago, the Earth was condensed into a infinitely hot, infinitely dense point that is known as the singularity. And from that point, all mass and all energy and everything we know in the entire universe started, and it started about 13.7 billion years ago and has been expanding ever since. And so that's essentially the birth of the universe, this expansion from an infinitely hot, infinitely dense single point into our modern day universe. Um, with this expansion came cooling. And after some time and some quite a significant amount of cooling, energies were low enough that atoms could form and we could actually get subatomic particles and we could start to get a nucleus that could bind some electrons. We started to see that hydrogen, or the theory is that hydrogen and helium form in the Big Bang, a little bit of a few other elements, but it's the universe is predominantly hydrogen and helium. And because there's some irregularities in terms of the mass distribution of atoms, gravity causes certain areas to start to collapse and those collapses lead to increases in temperature and density, as well as the rate of rotation. So if you've ever watched a figure skater, for example, in the Winter Olympics, they will co commonly do a, a rotation where they have their arms out and they're spinning relatively slowly. And as they bring their arms in and concentrate the mass towards the center spin axis, they spin up very quickly. This is one of the reasons we believe that our solar system has the rotation that it has. All of our planets rotate in the same direction because as the mass was concentrated towards the center and created our star, the sun, 
that caused this rotation to continue to speed to spin up. And as the this matter is forming throughout the, the, the early universe, we start to get areas that start to gain a little bit more mass. And this is a positive feedback because the gravitational pull is directly proportional to mass. So the more mass you add, the more gravity you have such that you can pull in more of your surrounding region. As you pull more of their surrounding region in, you grow in mass. That mass gives you even more gravity. And so you get this positive feedback loop and you start to have the first stars form pretty early in the universe history. And it's these early stars that are gonna be very important when we start to think about the elements that we have in our solar system and on Earth, because we know that we don't have just hydrogen and helium, which were primarily formed in the Big Bang. We have a whole plethora of different elements, and it's going to be the stars that are going to be crucially important in making those elements. So this is the periodic table of the elements, and hydrogen and helium are at the top, one and two on the left and the right. And you can see that there are about 94 elements that are naturally occurring on Earth. There's about 24 others that are radioactive or produced through radioactive decay. Um, but there is a, a quite a bit more elements than just hydrogen and helium. And it's really important that we talk about um, how these elements are formed, because for us to understand how the Earth works, we're going to need to know something about the distribution of elements on the planet and how that's going to eventually work its way into rocks because that's going to dictate how certain things like plate tectonics for example behaves a lot of how plate tectonics behaves at plate boundaries is dictated by the density for example of the rocks which is dictated by the minerals in the rocks which is dictated by the elements in those minerals And so it's really the stars that are forming the elements. So stars like our sun are massive enough and have enough pressure and heat towards their core that they can have the process of nuclear fusion occur. Nuclear fusion is the process of taking two smaller atoms and fusing them together to make something larger. Take two hydrogens and you can make a helium. Take a hydrogen and a helium, you can make a lithium. Take a couple lithiums, you can make a carbon. And this process is efficient and releases energy. And the stars are very good at, at, at making elements up to about iron. And that's um, number 26 on the periodic table, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, after about iron, there isn't a much uh, energy gain from doing this. So this fusion process is pretty efficient all the way up until iron, but because we have so many other elements, we wanna have an idea of where those come from. And the best idea right now is that those will require even greater energy. And the only energies that we think would be sufficient is when certain massive stars finish their lives, they explode. And that explosion we call a supernova. And it's in these explosions that there is sufficient energy to create all of the rest of our heavy elements that we see on the periodic table. So stars like our sun are really efficient at fusing things up to iron. And they that's great because the energy that we get from the sun is a byproduct of this fusion reaction. This is the thermal radiation, visible light. There's a lot of, of unwanted things that we'll talk about that luckily Earth magnetic field protects us from because some of these reactions release a lot of high energy particles and things that could be damaging to life. And then elements beyond iron are essentially created in supernova. And so it's absolutely true that we are all stardust. This is a quote by Lawrence Krauss. And so I'll just read it to you because he puts this better than I could. Every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. 
you couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution and for life weren't created at the beginning of time. They were created in the nuclear furnaces of stars. And the only way for them to get into your body is if those stars were kind enough to explode. The stars died so that you could be here today. And it really is true that our solar system is a second or third or maybe even fourth generation solar system. And we know that because of the distribution of elements that we see on Earth and within our solar system. The fact that we have many elements heavier than iron suggests that stars in our surrounding area were going supernova. They were ejecting their material into the, the cloud of gas and dust that eventually formed our solar system. And that's why we have the distribution of elements that we have today, because we know that it couldn't have been just formed by our star alone. And so we really are a second, third, or fourth generation solar system. So as our solar system starts to collapse, the nebula starts to condense because of this positive feedback of gravity. The vast majority of the mass ends up into the center in the sun. In fact, something like 99.8% of the mass is in the sun. And the leftover remnants that didn't get pulled into the sun starts to form what we call planetesimals. These are the embryos of what will eventually become planets. And then those planets will go through this same positive feedback system that as they grow, they start to incorporate more and more of their material and they start to clean their orbit such that when we look at our solar system today in the bottom picture, we see a star in the middle and planets that have different distances from the sun that have relatively clean orbits because they were efficient at removing the material that was in their orbit to create the planet. When we look at our solar system, we find that the first four planets look and, and exist in different regions than the outer four planets. So the inner four planets being Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. They are what we call the terrestrial planets. So they are primarily made of metals and rocks, metallic cores with rocky shells and they tend to be relatively small and they orbit relatively close. So the image up above is our solar system to scale in terms of size. And then in the lower image, we see that this is a, a relative picture that is not to scale of um, their orbits. And so the, what we can see is that the first four, the terrestrial planets tend to be relatively small and they also orbit very close to the sun. And the outer four planets, which we call the Jovian planets or the ice giants, they tend to be predominantly made out of ices and gases, although they do have metallic and rocky cores. They have a lot of gas and ice because they're far enough away from the sun that things that exist as gases, for example, on Earth tend to exist as solids when you get away from the sun and get into some of these cold temperatures. And they also have very distant orbits and they're relatively spread apart as compared to the four inter or terrestrial planets. So if you are in my generation, you likely grew up uh, learning that there were nine planets and that has been changed in the last couple decades. We now uh, accept that there are eight planets and the reason that Pluto got the, the boot from the solar system as in terms of being considered a planet is because it failed one of the three criteria that was developed by the Astronomical Society to, uh, to determine what makes a planet. And they came up with three Criteria: It must orbit a star. Pluto does fall into that category because it does orbit the sun. Although its orbit, as you can see on the right, is not exactly on the galact on the on the uh, celestial plane that the other planets tend to be on. Its orbit was 
a little bit interesting. It has a little bit of a tilt to it. It also is a little bit more, it has a little bit more eccentricity where it actually comes with inside uh, Neptune's orbit for part of its orbit. It must be roughly spherical in shape. That's a size requirement. Um, this is a way that astronomers could avoid having to call every asteroid in the asteroid belt a, a planet because most of those are oddly shaped. And if, a, if a, a celestial body gets to a certain size, we think that it will be somewhat molten and it will take on a spherical shape, like for example, a droplet that you'll see sometimes scientists at the ISS playing around and they'll have a little droplet of water. And you can see it takes on this nice spherical shape because of surface tension. So this is a size requirement. Uh, you can see the image of Pluto there on the right. Pluto does fit that criteria. And the final criteria was that it must be able to clear its neighborhood of other objects. And this is what got Pluto essentially kicked out of the planetary solar system club, because what we started to identify was that with better and better telescopes, we could see that there was more and more of these objects that were really far away, but pretty close to Pluto's orbit. So the dilemma became, do we start to incorporate more of these objects and, and expand the number of planets, or do we consider Pluto as something other than a planet and which has now been demoted to a dwarf planet? but it's because of this fact that there are many other objects similar to Pluto of similar size and similar orbit that it didn't sufficiently clear its neighborhood of other objects and thus it fails one of the criteria that is required to be considered a planet. And so the Earth is forming at this time as well as the, the the solar system is forming and our, our sun is forming, the planets are forming at the same time. The earth is forming through collision, through accretion of material. So things are whizzing in because they are being trapped by earth's gravity well. And it, the earth pulls these things, these, this material in, it impacts the surface with a very high velocity and a lot of energy. There's quite a bit of young, very radioactive elements around, for example, aluminum 26. These are things that have long decayed away, but they were pretty active in the early solar system as the sun and the earth was forming. And so this was a very violent and a very energy rich environment as the earth is forming. This formation process allowed for the earth to go through a process known as differentiation. Differentiation was the separation of Earth into layers of density. And so the uh, metals and iron and nickel and what we call the siderophile elements and, and that the elements that like to be in a metallic phase, they sank towards the core then the medium density material that is predominantly certain rock types, mafic minerals known as things like olivine or rock types like perovskite, this made what we call the mantle. So this was this very thick stony shell around the core that had a medium density. And then we made this very thin and very light crust on the outer portion of the surface of the earth that tended to be the leftover material that was low in density and was not siderophile, meaning it didn't want to go into the metallic phase. And thus it was kind of pushed out towards the edges and created what we know as earth's crust. Soon after earth's formation, it is thought that a collision occurred, which formed our moon. The reason that the collision hypothesis tends to be the most prominent hypothesis is the fact that the moon looks very identical geochemically to Earth, even isotopically identical. And now that we have asteroids from the asteroid belt, or we have what we're pretty confident are asteroids from Mars, we can see that 
there is a relative difference depending on where an object formed throughout the solar system. Things have individual geochemical fingerprints. And so how do we get the moon to look identical to the Earth? The wild, widely accepted theory is that an object came and impacted the Earth very early on in Earth's history within something like 50 to 100 million years of Earth's formation. And that impact was sufficient enough to throw material into Earth's orbit. And that material eventually coalesced into the moon, thus making the moon essentially the same as the Earth because it's made out of rocks that were at one time part of the Earth. And thus you can have this isotopically identical moon that is orbiting Earth. So here's a computer simulation of what that would look like. Um, this is a moon forming impact from Robin Canup at the Southwest Research Institute. And you see this glancing blow and a lot of material get thrown into, um, into orbit around Earth. And some of that material will re impact on Earth, but other material will actually um, uh, start to coalesce into what we consider little moonlets. Um, sometimes those moonlets will get torn apart, but ultimately you end up with a moon that is essentially created from Earth material and thus it is isotopically and geochemically identical to Earth. And very soon after this moon forming impact, it appears through evidence of the oldest minerals on the planet, these are ancient zircon grains, the side of, of little sand grains that date back to about 4.4 billion years ago, it appears that the Earth started to take on a, a look that we are much more familiar with relatively early in its history. The original ideas were that the Hadean uh, eon, this is the first 550 million years of the Earth's existence, was known as the Hadean and this is no uh, this is named after the god of the underworld hades because the theory was that this was a very violent and inhospitable surface at that time but more and more the evidence is suggesting that although yes there were still big impacts coming in there was quite a bit of volcanism and quite a bit of energy in the system it appears that there was surface waters and there was water rock interactions um, there was, uh, the moon was there, so were there tides, and there's been uh, recent evidence by a former office mate of mine, Dr. Elizabeth Bell, that showed that the carbon isotopes in some of these ancient zircons dating back to about 4.1 billion years appear to suggest that the origin of life was likely during this Hadean eon within the first few hundred million years of Earth's existence. And 4.5 billion years later, we have the image of Earthrise, and we have our planet, our pale blue dot. And let's talk about some of the things that make Earth unique. The primary thing that makes our planet unique from every other planet we have explored in our solar system thus far is that the Earth can harbor life. And in fact, the Earth allows life to flourish. And there's a few really important aspects of Earth that allow for this flourishing of life. And it's difficult for us to try to understand any other way that a planet could sustain life because with a data set of one, it's very difficult to try to imagine other planets with life on them. Um, I'm a, a fan of going to Mars and exploring Mars, but we're pretty confident that the current surface of Mars today cannot harbor life. Now, whether or not four billion years ago when there was liquid water at the surface, was that a possibility then? Um, I think that, that I would argue that it probably was a possibility then. And there's new exciting missions going to moons of Jupiter like Europa that have an icy shell, have liquid water underneath this icy shell, 
likely have enough thermal heat down there to help to foster some reactions. Um, and so, you know, I think that in the next few decades, we'll really start to get a better handle on the idea whether life evolved on any other planet. But thus far, we have only a sample set of one. And so we're going to just focus on what allows life to flourish on Earth. One of the primary aspects of understanding whether a planet is habitable or not is the idea of the distance of the planet to its star. And we call this the habitable zone or sometimes colloquially called the Goldilocks zone. And this is the idea that if you're too close to your star and that's gonna depend on the size of the star, the bigger and more mass of the star and the more luminosity, luminosity and radiation that's coming off, the farther away you have to be. But if you're too close, you're too hot. And what that means is that water at your surface won't exist in the liquid phase. It will exist only in the gas phase as water vapor. And if you're too far away, then the water on the surface will only exist in the solid phase as ice. And if you're just right, in this habitable zone, then you'll have the correct temperatures where you can have liquid water at the surface. And again, we think it's a criteria to have liquid water for evolution of life on Earth. Does that mean that it's a criteria for everywhere else? Well, again, we only have the data set of one, but it seems to be that water is a requirement for the evolution of life. Earth is just on the outside of the habitable zone. In fact, if we didn't have an atmosphere, the surface temperature of the planet would be on the order of about minus 20 degrees Celsius. The current average temperature, if such a thing exists, we can talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about climate. Um, current estimates of an average surface temperature are on the order of 15 degrees Celsius. So it's this 35 degrees Celsius in the greenhouse effect that is actually allowing Earth, which is just outside the habitable zone and would have water in the form of ice to actually have liquid water on the surface. So we talked about the sun and the, the fusion process that the sun is, is going through and fusing lighter elements up into heavier elements all the way up to iron. In that reaction, although there's a lot of great things like solar radiation and visible light that allow Earth to, to function as the way it does and provide heat to the atmosphere. There's quite a bit of relatively nasty stuff that also comes out of these reactions. We call this the solar wind. So this is high energy electrons and protons and other charged particles and things like plasma that are actually harmful to life. Thankfully, our planet has a magnetic field We'll go into a little bit more about how that magnetic field is, is formed. We call that a geodynamo. The idea is that this is likely a, 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 pro, a product of the fact that we have a liquid outer core and that this molten iron is moving within the outer core and that kinetic energy is thus converted into magnetic energy and the Earth essentially behaves like a dipole magnet that you may have played with before. Magnetic field lines exit out of the South Pole and they enter in back in in the North Pole. This is why if you hold a compass and you have this little needle in the compass, it will eventually line up with these magnetic field lines and point towards North. It is this magnetic field that protects us from the solar wind. And so this is all this high energy particles that are coming through. Without this solar wind, it's difficult to understand, sorry, without this magnetic field, it's difficult to understand how you could have really complex life forms develop on the surface because of their exposure to these high energy particles. There's quite a bit of debate. When did the geodynamo actually start and when did the magnetic field on the planet begin? We had a paper a couple years ago in Science Advances that argued that there wasn't good evidence that that there was a there was a strong magnetic field in the Hadean um, within the first few hundred million years of life of, of the Earth uh, forming, and 
one of the arguments for, uh, for example, the evolution of life in undersea black smokers and hydrothermal vents is you have a lot of energy in the system for uh, to, to, to push reactions of, of precursor biomolecules to eventually becoming something that is self-replicating and something we would consider life. But you'd also be shielded from a lot of these particles because their penetration depth in water is relatively short. So you could just be under the surface of water and you could actually be protected from a lot of these high energy particles. And the Earth functions as a system, really. It's a very dynamic system. It's the interactions of the atmosphere and the hydrosphere and the biosphere and the lithosphere that are key in terms of recycling materials and constantly evolving the surface such that the planet is very dynamic. It's always changing. And it's this constant change and recycling that has really been uh, has really allowed for life to flourish. The Earth has an atmosphere. That atmosphere is predominantly made out of two gases. It's relatively thin as compared to the rest of the Earth. It's predominantly made out of nitrogen and oxygen. That's about 99% of the Earth's atmosphere. The other 1% is predominantly argon that has escaped through the radioactive decay of things like potassium. And then there are some trace gases like carbon dioxide and methane, ozone, sulfur dioxide, nitrous dioxide, nitrous oxide. And some of these gases we'll get into a little bit more when we start talking about climate and the greenhouse effect. The structure of Earth's atmosphere in terms of pressure is relatively simple. As you go up in terms of elevation, the column of air above you is now reduced and thus pressure has been decreased because the higher you go in elevation, the less air there is above you that's pushing down on you. And so you see in the left picture that as altitude increases on the y-axis, we see a steady decline from atmospheric pressure at the surface to very, very low, almost no pressure and essentially a vacuum as you start to exit out into the into space, into the vacuum of space. The temperature profile that you see on the right is a little bit different. You, most of us have experienced the temperature decline that we see in the troposphere. That's the first 11 or so kilometers at the bottom. As you go up in at altitude, you go down in temperature, right? If you want to go skiing, usually you go to some tall mountains because those are areas where the air, the surface temperatures will be cold enough that precipitation will fall as snow. And thus, if you want to slide down a mountain on some skis or a snowboard, you pretty much have to go up in elevation in order to get there, especially if you're not in the northern latitudes. But then the temperature profile actually changes quite a bit. You can see that at the top of the stratosphere, the temperatures are almost identical to the temperatures at the surface of the Earth. This has to do with ozone and other gases actually trapping some of the solar radiation. And we'll come back to this a little bit more when we talk about climate. And the properties of the stars and of stars and Earth are relatively simple when we think about it in terms of elemental distribution. Our sun and most stars are predominantly helium and hydrogen still. They are fusing elements all the way up to iron, but they're still predominantly helium and hydrogen. As we just showed, our Earth's atmosphere is predominantly nitrogen and oxygen. And the Earth itself is over 90% of it is made out of four elements, iron, oxygen, silicon, and magnesium. And so it's really seven elements, helium, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, silicon, and magnesium that create the vast majority of the stuff we see and are familiar with in terms of the, our, our own star and the sun, our atmosphere that is obviously essential for us as, as, as uh, oxygen respirating organisms and the earth in general for all of our resources and, and uh, raw materials. Something that we'll come back to a lot is that as you go into earth, both pressure and temperature increase 
So we're going to come back to this a bunch when we start talking about, for example, how rocks are formed and how we make magmas and how volcanoes behave and things like that. So we'll keep in mind that pressure and temperature always increase as you go down below the surface and into the center of the towards the center of the earth. If you've ever had the experience of going down into a very deep cave, you may have experienced that temperature increase before. Um, coal miners, for example, are very familiar with this temperature increase. It can get very hot inside these very deep coal mines. And because the planet isn't uniform, there's no real uniform increase per kilometer. On average, we use rough numbers of about 15 degrees Celsius per kilometer in areas that are relatively cool and then on the order of 50 degrees Celsius per kilometer in areas where maybe there's some active uh, volcanism, there's active magmas in the crust and obviously if you have these hot bodies of rock, molten rock, they're going to increase how much heat you experience as you go down. And we call this the geotherm. The geothermal gradient, so geo-earth, thermal, the temperature gradient, how it's changing as you go down. The image on the right is the geothermal gradient. What you can see is that in the very thin crust at the top, the temperature increases very quickly. And this is due to the fact that that area of our planet is essentially losing heat through conduction meaning that it takes the vibrations of atoms that are next to other atoms, and as they vibrate, they pass along this vibrational energy. And so you can get a very big temperature change over a relatively short amount of depth as you're going down into the, into the Earth. As we get into the mantle, the mantle starts to behave a little bit more like silly putty, for example. It's not molten by any means, but it's malleable. It's it can flow over geologic time. And what that means is that convection starts to take over in the mantle. And convection is the actual motion of hot material would be coming off of the core mantle boundary at about 3,000 kilometers down. And that material would be coming up towards the surface. It'd be cooling and then it'd be sinking back down. And you can almost think of a lava lamp if you're about my age, you've probably seen lava lamps or maybe even had one. <clears throat> and what's happening is the red material that's inside the lava lamp is near the bulb at the bottom. So it's warming up. As it warms up, it starts to have a buoyancy force and it rises. And eventually as it rises and moves away from the bulb, it cools and then it sinks back down. And so when you start to have convection, what that does is it reduces the geothermal gradient such that you don't see such a rapid change in temperature over the same relatively shallow change in depth. And so we'll finish by taking a quick look at what the Earth's interior looks like after this process of differentiation. We were left with a crust. This crust is divided into two flavors. It's predominantly made out of silicon and oxygen, and we divide it into two subsets that are known as the continental crust. That tends to be the land masses that we see that are above sea level. And then the oceanic crust, this tends to be the majority of the surface of the earth that is covered by oceans. And the reason that the oceans exist where they do today is because the oceanic crust is relatively thin and it's relatively high in density, meaning that it sits a little bit lower than the continental crust, which is relatively thick and relatively low in density. So if you have something thin and it's very dense, it's gonna sit a little lower than something that's thick and has a low density, that's gonna have a buoyancy force. It's almost going to float a little higher. And if you pour water onto a dry planet, the water will fill in the low-lying areas and thus, where the oceans exist, where the certain crustal type of rock exists that we call the oceanic crust. There is a dividing layer or boundary between the lower crust and the upper mantle. This was named from a famous Eastern European uh, uh, earth scientist by the name of Mohokovic, and this is known as the, the uh, Moho, and this is the boundary layer between the crust 
and the mantle. And then there's a in distinct chemical difference between the crust and the mantle, and that boundary is known as the moho. As we keep going down into the crust, we get into the largest and the, the thickest portion of the crust by volume. This is known as the, as the mantle. It's predominantly a couple rocks known as peridotite or perovskite. Um, this tends to be relatively soft rock. It's solid. It has a very small percentage of liquid, so it's predominantly solid but it can flow over geologic time scales. It's going to flow about the rate of that your fingernails grow, which is on the order of about a few centimeters per year. And then our innermost portion of the planet is our core. This is divided into an outer core, which is a liquid iron nickel alloy, and then an inner core, which is a solid iron nickel alloy. It's the pressure change of the inner portion of the core that allows the inner portion to be solid, even though it's at a higher temperature than the outer core. Most materials actually expand when they change, transition from the solid phase to the liquid phase. Ice is a very unique uh, example. So water actually expands as it goes into the solid phase. That's why when you drop an ice cube into water, it actually floats. That's a very unique situation. Usually something that is transitioning from the solid to the liquid phase will expand. And thus, if you have a very high pressure and you don't give it any room to have that expansion, you can heat things up above essentially their melting temperatures and keep them solid. That's one of the theories of why we have a solid inner core and a liquid outer core. And so those distinctions of a crust, mantle, and core are important in terms of their chemical differences. But in our next lecture, we're going to be talking a little bit about plate tectonics. And in that sense, we are more interested in their mechanical properties. And when we talk about mechanical properties, we divide the planet a little bit differently. We divide the upper surface, which in, has the crust and the uppermost mantle. We call that the lithosphere, litho being rock, sphere meaning a shell. So this is a rocky shell. And this is the portion of the crust that behaves in a brittle fashion. It is so close to the surface, it's relatively cool and thus it starts to behave brittly, in meaning that it breaks, it doesn't bend or fold or flow, like, for example, the asthenosphere, which is now the lower portion, this is all a portion of the mantle, that can essentially flow over time. It's still a solid, it's not a liquid, but it allows the lithospheric plates on top to essentially move around when we start talking about plate tectonics. It's almost like a lubrication for the lithospheric plates. And ultimately, Earth's fate will be that it will be swallowed by the red giant phase of our sun. Uh, it's, it's hypothesized that on the order of about 5 billion years or so, the sun will start to run out of energy and in this process of running out of energy, it essentially expands and it would expand to about two, over two times Earth's orbit. And so we would essentially be inside of the sun. The Earth would be vaporized because of the enormous temperatures that are associated with our sun. But we have on the order of about five more billion years before that happens. So I don't think it's something we should be too worried about just yet. Well, I hope you enjoyed the first of what I hope will be many lectures that I will be putting out, I believe, weekly. Um, again, you can find most of these lectures through my Twitter, at Matthew Wileke. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments there, and I will do my best to address them. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and you'll join me again next week for a lecture about plate tectonics before we start getting into our different rock and mineral types. All right, thanks again and have a great day.